Well, hello on the Rockers. On this week's episode, we talk to actor Getty Watanabe. With over 45 years in the business, he's appeared in 16 Candles, Mulan, Sesame Street, and Sondheim Musicals. We're going to talk about it all with my guest co-host, actor Stephanie Erb from NCIS, True Blood, Ray Donovan, and the list goes on and on and on with me, your favorite host with the sassy most. Raise a glass and let the drinks begin. I'd like to propose a toast. This is On the Rocks with Alexander, where I drink with your favorite celebrities as we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV, and, well, that's about it. So pop a cork, lean back, and raise a glass to On the Rocks. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Lord have mercy. I love watching that little opening montage because I see all of the many... Uh, Weights of Alexander, like post-COVID, COVID, COVID <laughs> da, da, da. it's like, oh my. <laughs> That's why I have a big closet, not because it's a lot of clothes. Well, I mean, it is, but it's 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 like Goldilocks every time I, I get dressed. It's like, which closet are we in today? I think everyone is in that boat, <laughs> God, no. pandemic wise. I can't get out of the boat. I yeah. sunk that boat. Talk about Titanic, too. Uh, Bunsen, and and Pantyhose on the Rocks podcast, a place where we're too glad to give a damn. Okay, it was announced that Pamela Anderson... <laughs> is going to be making her Broadway debut as Roxy Hart in Chicago. What? What? It's a real thing. I had to make sure that it was it was, was it was not made up. No, thing. it's real. So, <laughs> they're going to change the beginning song from All That Jazz to either All That Hair or All That Chest. <laughs> But no one is changing it to all that voice. But up, bump. <laughs> no, I know. Like Chicago has always been stunt casting, but that's ridiculous. Yeah, I don't know if she can sing. Maybe that's what she used to do in kindergarten or something. We don't know. <sighs> oh my God. <laughs> you know, and people say, "Oh, just just throw them in Chicago," know, but it is a singing okay, part. Alexander, the sad part is that people will pay tickets to see it, no matter what she does, or whether it's good or bad or embarrassing. I mean, I would say, like, when they put NeNe Leakes in there or Erica Jane, they had all the Bravo TV and all the tourists. Right. I just don't know Pamela has that draw right now. Uh, you know, they have that Hulu. Yes, she does because of uh, that. You think? that TV show. Oh, yeah. I mean, if I got a press pass, I'm not sure that. That, that you would go. Mm -mm. Well, I, I don't think I would either. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, let's not go together. <laughs> yes. Not that they invited me because I just said that. <laughs> anyway, the show is brought to you by Fandaddies.com, bringing you the sassiest and classiest clacking fans and hats for prides, EDM parties, selfies, and even sci fi nerds head to Fandaddies.com. And of course, a word of warning tonight's shenanigans are being fueled by the tastings of Neft Vodka. Pure taste. It's damn good vodka. Vodka as it should be that can be drank neat or with anything you want to mix for it. And uh, just, I know we are boycotting uh, vodkas because, you know, it's yes. assuming it's for Russia. This is produced in Austria by the way. Excellent. So with spring water, and I'm telling you, I never have a hangover when I have this vodka. It's insane. That's really interesting. Yeah, and look how cute it comes in a little barrel. it looks enough. Yeah. It. Drink up, Stephanie. Uh, yes, Even though I know you yes, have a sir. big audition I do, so tomorrow. I'm not going to drink a lot. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> so when I used to go on auditions, it's like, what if I turned it so this person was like an alcoholic? Because then I'd be ready for, for anything. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, too, <laughs> I'd be like, <laughs> it's like, you are a sixth grade teacher who's an alcoholic. Who's an and alcoholic. they're like, no, no, that wasn't part of it. It's one line. You I'm like, what? no, no, but they're not calling. Look, there was a, an interview with Chris Walken while, where he was talking about <laughs> the crazy stuff he would do to make what he was doing interesting. Yeah. He was like, I'm a pirate. He would be <laughs> thinking that in his head while he's playing someone's dad, you know? And, and it, look, it, it can help you be interesting. And you know, he always does have that kind of look where he's kind of like on some other planet. Well, but he, we're here for he it. He is, because yeah. he's a pirate. So I wonder what he does like on his days off. Like, is he watching Judge Judy and going, my God, she's so great. I would love to see a documentary on what Christopher Walken yes. does on his days off. Yes. That would be fascinating. 100%. Uh, well, let's officially welcome you back to the show. Uh, well, no stranger you. to On the Rock, Stephanie Erb is an, uh, an actress of over 100 film and TV appearances, uh, also a writer, director, producer of dark and quirky comedies, the likes that have not been seen before the dawn of man. Since the dawn of man. Well, <laughs> never. Um, she, she has co-created many comedies with female geniuses, Go International Women's Day, uh, that can be seen and enjoyed on many digital platforms. As an actress, she tackles comedy and drama with equal gusto, reoccurring roles on Ray Donovan, True Blood, The Young and the Restless, Weeds, 24, The Fosters, of course, the iconic Freaks and Geeks. 
And during the previous dreary year, she worked on NCIS LA, Ryan Murphy's Monster for Netflix, Prime's new series, A League of Their Own. Yes, it is a TV series. And the new Bosch spinoff, which everybody's very excited about. Uh, She's also appeared in Fearless, The Little Things, The Ring, and, of course, uh, my favorite, Starship Troopers and more. Uh, She does theater whenever she can. And most recently, she appeared in Bakersfield Mist at Coachella Valley Rep. Uh, Her performance was labeled by critics a masterclass in acting. Please welcome back Stephanie Earp. Oh, why, thank you. (laughs) So we are going to be talking to Getty Watanabe, who has such a wealth of of credits. Oh, man, does he ever. And every time you come on the show, I always research. I'm like, God, I I forgot. She did this and this and this and that. Looking at performances from your past, and we know you made your early appearance was on Star Trek. Yes, which is first TV appearance. First TV appearance. Star Trek The Next Generation, yes. Um, And you did so many projects. um, And plus, you never age, by the way. And I was like, "Mm, hmm, hmm, hmm. Yes, I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, you know, this, you I know. drink the blood of virgins. Well, something because you know they're like you know white do crack. I'm like not my friend Stephanie Earp. Well, okay. In my defense, I come from my mother's 94, and people think she's in her 70s, mm-hmm. and I never went in the sun ever because I never tanned. I turned pink, and then I, everything peeled off my body, and it was not attractive. <laughs> so I just I always wore hats. I'm a hat lady, and I always wore sunscreen. So that helps a lot. Okay, so I want to ask you, in looking back at some of your early, early performances, you know, we all evolve as podcasters, as actors, as singers, and we all change. Yes. Are there any performances that you look back and you're like, wow, that, that was a choice? <laughs> well, I, I, I think I've said this before, but for, because I didn't know what I was doing, because I came from theater, and when I booked Star Trek, I was rather terrified. And I, because I, I'm a very a vociferous person, mm-hmm. I'm ebullient, and I just did not want to look like I was overacting on camera, but I really didn't know what I was doing. Well, and so Star Trek I, is an epic opera, too. It is, but I just watched what Patrick Stewart did, and I tried mm. to copy him. So he would yawn before takes to relax his face, so I did that, too. <laughs> but then I really noticed when I look back at it that I'm trying so hard not to move my face that it's kind of like I am talking like I'm uh, the Terminator or something, which is fine because that works for that show. But now I can see exactly what I'm doing. And also that I was very young. So how do you, <laughs> so how do you relax? I know that you've guest starred on, on some major shows, yeah. and it's like, okay, you know what? You are the guest star for this episode. Here's your episode. How do you handle those nerves? Oh, uh, well, it's hard. It just it all depends on the set, the m- mood of the set. Some sets are really uncomfortable, and you go into your trailer, and you try to stay away from everybody, and other times there's really lovely, friendly people. And other times you go to craft service and just eat candy all day, which is one thing that I might do. I try not to do that anymore. If I ever did that, my wardrobe person would be like, nope, I quit. <laughs> it's like mid-season, let's change suit sizes. It's more or less a joke, but really not true, because if they have good candy, it's hard to stay away. So, Do you think they do that for like sugar to keep people up? Uh, undoubtedly, people use it for that. I mean, every show has different craft service, too, which is, I'm, I did the Ellen show, the first sitcom, and I had a recurring role as Jeremy Piven's girlfriend on that, and they had the best food. They must have spent a bazillion dollars. That was in the olden times. Now, in the new times, I think... Here's a you're, Subway sandwich. You're lucky if you get a little bags of potato chips. And, of course, COVID has changed it. So every, yeah. everything is individually wrapped and separate from all other things. Well, <laughs> that's what I was asked for about. Whenever I do a gig, I'm like, okay, is it open bar? Like, what's what's in the dressing room? No, blah, there's blah, no blah. bar. Oh. <laughs> they don't see. want... I will, the I will say I've been is a little on different. one set where I do believe one of the actors was getting boozed up, but I, you can't And it was Elaine Stritch. <laughs> Stritchy. I wish it was her, but no, it was not. <laughs> All right. We are going to welcome our guest of honor today. Uh, so exciting. I saw him opening night at East West Players Assassins. Please welcome uh, Getty Watanabe. He made his Broadway debut in the 1975 original Broadway cast of Pacific Overtures, written uh, music and lyrics, of course, by Stephen Sondheim and directed by Hal Prince. Uh, 
Uh, he's been a working actor for over 45 years and is known for many roles on stage, TV, and film that include memorable roles in 16 Candles, Mulan, ER, Sesame Street, and UHF, with appearances on The Simpsons, Seinfeld, Family Guy, Murphy Brown, and many, many more. And he, when I say many, many more. I do Tons. mean it. He is currently returning to his Sondheim roots as Charles Guiteau in East West Players production of Assassins. You can also catch him playing Gary Chen in the comedy The Disappointments on YouTube. Please welcome Getty Watanabe. <laughs> Hello, sir. H Hello. Oh my goodness. I, I was looking at all the old the pictures of the old uh, some of the old movies. Oh yes. <laughs> you know, it's funny when you go down this Getty Watanabe like rabbit hole. It's like oh, yes, and that, and that, and that. It never ends. No, and it's it's so <laughs> colorful, and it's like you've been like through a wonderland of, of your might career. Be the right word, colorful. <laughs> Well, we're going to talk about this, some of that color. I mean, your career literally reads like a movie. You grew up in Utah, did theater in school. Then you end up as a street musician in San Francisco. Then you end up on Broadway for your first role, making your, your, your Broadway debut. What inspired that move from Utah to San Francisco to be a street performer? Like, what was happening? Um, uh, I had to get out of Utah. <laughs> it was the main reason. <laughs> And also, I, I, you know, I, I didn't want to do what my my parents wanted me to do, which was a, a, a be a doctor or a lawyer or something. You know, it just didn't work. And also, I couldn't add, so <laughs> I, there was just no way. I, I was so bad at math, and it was very anti-Asian. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was really bad at math. <laughs> but you, you did a lot of uh, plays in school, and so, but your parents were like, oh, that's fine for school, but not for career? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, my, they thought that this was the worst choice of my life. And so uh, so I pretty much was on my own. But, you know, I, 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 I actually was happy about it because I had, to, I had to prove to myself that I could, you know, do it. So uh, it was... In some sense, I took a, a lemon into lemonade, as they say. <laughs> well, they talking about living. We're talking about living a colorful life. Uh, working as a street performer in San Francisco. What did you learn most about life I, I doing that? I wanted to say hi. A shout out to you also. So, <laughs> to me? Yes. yes. Oh, hi. Yes. You're the only Stephanie here, girl. I hate to tell you, <laughs> Stephanie's we, we my alter ego. Like, I'm. I'm. We've young. never met, but I've seen you on Ray Donovan, which is one of my favorite. Films. Oh, that's oh, awesome! Thank you. Um, and I just have a question, real quick. Quick one for you. I know we're going to talk. About it. Yeah. Did, did you? Did you? Were you have? Did you ever consummate a relationship with him on the show? As no, a, no. I'm no. glad you said on the show. By the way. Yeah, I know. That, yeah. We that, saw some of those pictures. Actually, he, uh, Naomi Watts was at the the rap party, and they looked very much in love at the time. Yes. But um, no, oh. I played someone. I played a crooked politician that was bribing him yeah. to, uh, yeah. yeah. But they never, they never had it go on. I got, I got punched in the face and bitten by a snake, <laughs> and then he picked me up a deadlift off the ground. So I was well, like, he's, Liev's he's, doing he's his a big muscle guy. work, which, um, yeah, which constitutes for love in my, in my eyes. I agree. <laughs> I agree. It was no, truly. I, my husband had, would have been in big trouble if he had shown any interest at all. But um, he did. He put me in a car and sent me to the hospital, and you never heard from me again. Well, you heard, oh, right. oh, you heard right. that she survived, and I was like, oh, could I come back and be a love yeah, yeah, interest? Yeah. 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 No, that no, that was wasn't in the the books. Because there was a little bit of an attraction there, I thought, too. Wasn't oh, there? I thought so, too. You know, I have yeah. to say, on set, I think at first when a guest star shows up, people are on their guard. Like, are you going to be a jerk? Are you going to be a fun person <laughs> to work with? And I had seen a production of a Shakespeare play he did in New York, and I said something about oh. it. And I think that made him realize that I'm not just a bimbo or whatever. And then suddenly... <laughs> doing the scenes we tried to make it better together and as you know on tv you don't have a lot of time mm -hmm. sometimes right. the directors don't have anything to tell you to do yep. you just do your thing and you hit your mark and you pick up your pencil and you put it down and you go where you're supposed yep. to go and you leave but in this this was the most fun experience i think i've had on set because we worked on it together to make it better while we were doing it and and I was in heaven. I didn't want it to end. That was a... that's, that's 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 kudos to him, actually. Exactly. Yeah. No, I would love to work with him again. It would be nice. great. It is let's not talk about me. Well, no, but it, it is here. Here. I'm, sorry, I'm the worst. That I, I'd rather be the interviewer than the interviewer. 
That's my job, Getty. That's the only reason I'm here tonight. I, I know, you know, I can't help it. It's, it's curiosity killed the uh, cats. Well, I have to say, the, the original script was uh, your character went off to the hospital, and then they followed up saying her insurance didn't cover it, and that's the last. That oh, we yeah, because she <laughs> oh, <you're... laughs> sounds familiar. Yeah, sounds, yeah. Like a, sounds like what happens to SAG people. Our, uh, and he's yeah. like, oh, but pay your dues. Yeah, pay your dues, but now. you lose your insurance. Yeah, and during no, COVID, I, I could yeah. talk, mm. we could do an insurance episode. Yeah. I don't oh, know boy. if anyone would want yeah, to listen hello. to it though all right Getty, let's get back on track Boy, though because I mean, I, i'm so fascinated about being a street performer in san francisco in those early years like what did you learn most about life that you still like ascribe to today uh i guess you know street singing was kind of almost natural because i i i played the guitar and uh i didn't have any money and so uh, I, in the early days of Ghirardelli Square, I yes. sang there and I sang in Chinatown and uh, at the, in, on Grand Street where the Golden Dragons and there were yes. very many Asian faces. There weren't any Asian faces at that time, you know, street scene. So I think they kind of were uh, kind of taken back by it. And I, 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 I always remember I'd get tons of bok choy thrown at me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and uh, I used to take them home and stir fry them afterwards. No way. <laughs> so was it an insult to have bok choy thrown at you? Or, oh, I'm sure it it's was. Like tomatoes, okay. right? Well, I don't know. Uh, but... Tomatoes are much messier. <laughs> bok, bok choy is sort of artistic. It's like usable. <laughs> You're like yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I I I think I thought I was pretty good, but then you know, I could have been disillusioned. Who knows? And so, You're young. Uh, but I learned how to project how mm -hmm. to sing project because you uh, on the street so that's kind of what led me into into musicals it was kind of my class whether i knew it or not well and let's talk but, about getting into pacific overtures do you remember your audition for that or how did that opportunity come about i mean that's your first like big role is well, hey no, you're on broadway now <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, welcome actually, I, you know people say i was discovered on the street but that's not quite true there was just somebody who came by and heard me sing and said, do you want to, do you want to audition for a, a show? And I said, wow, I'm not really an actor. And they said, well, just come by. And so I went to, uh, I believe it was ACT at the mm -hmm. time. And, That's where they do a and, lot of the auditions. Yeah. And, and I didn't know anything about musical the theater that much, except my mom used to always sing, um, like me to hear me sing How Are Things in Glockamora. Mm. And, oh. <laughs> it was the only Broadway song I knew. <laughs> oh my God. That's so I cute. went and sang that, you know, like, a, you know, when I had a lot of hair, my Dorothy Hamill haircut at the time. And, uh, <laughs> and I, and I, I started singing, I hear a breeze, a London there, you know, and, and so they were kind of like, okay, this is unusual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and then they brought me to New York and uh, and I I uh, sang that same tune again. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was it was pretty exciting, but also kind of nerve wracking because I didn't know much about anybody. Yeah, I didn't know who Stephen saw. I didn't know who. That was probably good though. I was gonna say that. I, probably I think benefited it's good you. not to know anything. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it was because it it, it really. I think it it was. Uh, it was total innocence on my part trying mm. to figure out, you know, and I also didn't feel like I had a lot to lose. I mean, I've, I've always wanted to see New York at the time. So I thought, okay, this might be interesting. And so I, I in fact, I, I, uh, I, I remember somebody coming up to me and say, oh, congratulations, you're in the show. And I said, who are you? And he says, I'm Stephen Sondheim. Oh my God. Said, He's like, I wrote the I damn said, thing. Yeah, my God. I, I said, oh, and, and what do you do? <laughs> Oh shit! <laughs> he probably laughed at that, knowing like you know, knowing I about think him. They all, they all probably got a kick out of my innocence at that time. So I and I didn't really have, you know, a background of of, of musical theater. And and uh, uh, someone in a tree was was I guess he one of his favorite songs that he wrote. But I I I never knew what I had. You know, you just mm. kind of do the show. And you're, I think I was 19 at the time, wow. so I didn't really quite understand the show. <laughs> 
until a lot later, <laughs> which is really interesting. So, one of the questions I got from our listeners, um, in for you coming is, um, Stephen Sondheim is known to be so meticulous about every single note and every single rhythm, especially in the recording. So, not only did you make your Broadway debut, but then you're recording your first cast recording, um, in a room with all the musicians and Stephen Sondheim. Um, so the question we got is, how nerve-wracking was that? Did he kind of let you kind of do your own, or what was the recording experience like for you? Well, you know, I, 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 I heard this, and this later down the years made, made sense to me, is that he, he, he writes for you, for your personality. Oh, cool. A, a lot of yeah, times. I so uh, I think what had happened is, is that I did not know I had a song until much later in the rehearsal process. So I think he was kind of watching and listening to to my, you know, just my singing and my, a little bit of my personality. And the, the you know, at that time, I, I was so wide eyed and effervescent that probably, you know, I, I, I probably, you know, uh, uh, he, he kind of just grabbed that. And, and I knew that they were working on a song. And, uh, I, but I and I, honestly, I didn't know that song was I was supposed to be in it. So it was a lot later at the end of the rehearsal period that they brought me into the room, and I thought, oh God. And then um, I, I I didn't know how to, I still don't know, but I but I I should. And this is I'm <laughs> really I don't know how to read music that well. I, actually, I'm better at it now. But um, at that time, it was kind of like. It, if you ever heard that song from Pacific Over Pacific Overtures, it goes da 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 mm -hmm. and it just keeps going. Yeah. And you if you can't count, you've got to just feel it out. So it was uh it, and then after a while I it just it just you know just kind of grabbed me and I I I I just did it. <laughs> I don't 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 ask me how. I really don't know how <laughs> that kind of happened. And well, I and I didn't I wasn't afraid of the song as I, as I, uh, even at the recording studio, actually, I was, if that makes any sense. No, it does make sense. I have to tell you, I've never heard of somebody saying, oh, I can't read music that well in a Sondheim musical because we know it's all about, uh, like Shakespeare, where there's a it's pattern precision. and you miss that pattern. But in listening to a Sondheim musical, when you first hear Sondheim for the first time or you hear a new musical, you're like, wow, there was so much coming at you. Uh, yeah. But then when you sit into some of his songs, it just is comfortable. And it's like, then you fully can grasp the expanse of the song. But it's when you get comfortable in it and you relax oh, into it. That's very it. much like Shakespeare, actually. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's, I know this sounds really weird, but it's also, um, in a, it's so well thought out that you don't, that you don't have to, how do I say? It? You don't have to put anything else on it because it's so well thought it's, out. It's all Most you of need. all of his songs to me are that way now. Yeah. I mean, when I look back at them, they, they are meticulously thought out yeah. and placed in a certain area now. So you just kind of have to trust, I guess, that what that is. You know, nothing, there's no empty spaces in it, yes. in, in, in any of his material. I mean, I, I that's my experience with what little I, I, I've i done of him. But yes. Well, I mean, I mean you know, his debut with Pacific Overtures. And his star was on the rise. He had done Follies. He had done uh, Do I Hear a Waltz? Yeah. Um, and he had done Company. Company. And also Hal Prince's Follies. star was on the rise. And they, yes. Go ahead. No, oh, no, no. Sorry. They're saying that Hal Prince's and Sondheim's collaborations are some of the most important uh, pieces of musical theater for yeah. modern theater because it changed the whole scope. It changed the way shows were produced. And they say that that, that collaboration um, helped theater for what it is today. Um, and it's some of the most memorable uh, shifts of yeah. themes, dialogue, even music. But was it weird to be working on an Asian-themed show with two white Jewish guys? <laughs> <laughs> they were? I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> No, I, I, you know, honestly, I, I, I just thought it was so well written and so uh, well thought out. You know, at that time, we were all worried that there were, we were all going to be replaced by, you know, by a, um, by a white cast. Mm. So <laughs> I think we were all, you know, so that's always over your head, right? Because you know these things happen during that time. So, uh, but. 
wait, what was your original question? Here I go. This is when I turned 66 and I can't figure out what the last question is. Oh, that's <laughs> young. <laughs> no, that, that, that is young. <laughs> no, uh, but, but, being, uh, but being directed and having a whole musical written by, um, you know, the team being two oh, white no, Jewish guys. No, no, it, not in any way because it was so well thought out. Mm. Everything, you know, and it wasn't, st there were no stereotypes involved in this, in, mm. in, in this piece. It was well written and and it really to me does not matter if you're asian or not if you write a piece if you just think it out so well and you respect the what the story is it comes out fine it it, it usually does so um you know and we do need to support asian writers and asian yes. actors and everything like that but in that case no there was no uh there's no controversy about that at all I didn't, at least I didn't. But then don't forget I was 19 years old. So I was more starry eyed than than that's amazing. Um, maybe some of the older actors. Yeah. But I don't I didn't feel that at all. That um Well, and it was a few know. steps ahead. You know, let's mount this whole Broadway musical um yeah. that's Asian centric with Asian actors. I mean, who else would have would have done that? Um yeah. you know, now well, he was it's always like, ahead of his time. Always. Everything. You know, his shows were never really that well received. I that's mean that's true. When, yeah, when you think about it, and then now later down the road, they've become like these iconic, right. you know, I, I always say to people, I said, sometimes I'll walk through the day, and I'll say a lyric from a Sondheim mm -hmm. tune, and it will actually solve the riddle for me. <laughs> you know, I'll just quote something, and, it, and it's like, oh, yeah, that's a Sondheim song. So it's kind of like, there's a little bit of a Bible going on there, you know, with him, so... Well, and, yeah. it, and even in this show, even in our show, it's... I was going to say, constructed. Yeah. when yeah. Assassins I, opened, it was a flop our, off-Broadway. Our, right, and our show now feel, truly resonates to, for me, it resonates what happened on January the 6th, because I feel like all of these characters would have attended the, the January 6th uh, uh, in, insurrection. And so, we've all, dis we discuss that as a company, oh, wait, would you be there? Yes, I'd be there. Oh, yes, Cato would be there. <laughs> and and uh, so it's taken on a, a, a huge different reson, uh, resonation, is, if that's the right word to it. Uh, like um, I said, it, it, it was a huge flop when it appeared off Broadway, but it became this cult um, yes. favorite, especially with, with theater students. I remember listening to that album backwards and forwards and forwards and backwards. Victor Garber was in the original cast. Oh, yeah. Then, oh, right. It, yeah. But it was during the Reagan era where everybody yes. still loved the White House. Everybody still had this kind of respect what, for, oh, for, yes. Wait, no, it was, uh, wasn't that, was it the Bush era when, when, because of the Iraq war, I think it came, came. I, I could be wrong. We'll have to look that up. Yeah. I, I, th I think I, I, uh, I could, I, I think could it was wrong. during, the, but. All right. I'm not going to argue. I drink that. a lot. <laughs> Look at cheers Yay. cheers sweetie <laughs> cheers yes um but then the, the broadway reboot we know it was with with neil patrick i'm glad you got something there it, yeah. it's water but i have an audition that's so. all right oh god please i understand yeah. that yeah <laughs> i've got a day off i'm excited Yay. <laughs> hand me yours then girl <laughs> uh, but then this broadway remount and it was glossy and it was it was fabulous neil patrick harris and you know then everyone's like oh god oh, right. what, yes, what that, a great the, musical the new one yeah and then it became like, yeah. okay, now we can love this musical because it had its big Broadway Tony Awards and, and all this stuff. Um, but now so, seeing it, yeah. What I was just going to say, what makes our show so different is, is that it's, it's people of color. Yes. So it has a, a different resonation. Our booth is a, a wonderful, uh, Trent uh, Dumpson, he's a wonderful actor and he's black and he's playing booth. So it, it's, a, it's a really interesting, different kind of resonance, you know, res resonation to the to the to the uh, uh and and i'm curious to find out you know you i, I always wonder what did you think seeing a uh, seeing a, a cast of color playing this i'm i'm curious because i you know that's my uh <laughs> i mean i i, I always thought I, I, I love I mean, diverse. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just so excited talking. <laughs> it's okay. I'll stop. Okay. No, no, no. You're the guest. No, but th this excites me so much. I mean, I've always been into diverse casting. I mean, I was playing Charlie Brown as as a brown kid Aww. before, like you know, they, they did it on, on Broadway. But what? Assassins, knowing the the music so well to Assassins, and there's one of the most beautifully written lyrical parts, and I'm talking about the the melody is Booth's song. Um, 
and he says the n-word in the song and he talks yes. uh, it's it's yes. when you take the the speech from it it's very hate-filled but the way Sondheim it's uh, in all of his musicals this is such a standout as one of the most beautiful moments it's so lyrical and so beautiful yes. and watching it, it opening night I got teary-eyed I, I get chills when I hear trance yeah singing our country is not what it was you know that beautiful lyric it's 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 extraordinarily uh, layered in the fact that that him being black is saying this being booth being you know the whole Jack's position is so interesting now it, uh, he's the emancipator is the one that he's yep. fighting against you know and it's 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 a fascinating juxtaposition so uh, I kudos to Snehal who, who is our director at East West Players and um you know just taking the chance I would never be there, I would never be cast as Gateau in a in a in this no ever so, this was great you know i grew this thing just to see if i could <laughs> even i didn't know i could even grow it <laughs> i woke up and I, oh my god what happened to you <laughs> well and you did and and you nailed it um but i have to oh. say the 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 multicultural casting made me uh you know how we go see musicals and we've listened to the soundtrack or the the recording over like wicked we we know it over and over and even if you go see a production today of wicked you're not hugely surprised by any of the choices but this made you pay attention to the lyrics in a different way it made you look at the musical oh, in a different way and Thank so you to your that. point even in that one small section that booth has i was listening for that beautiful run um and then i just got emotional because it just brought up so many memories but then you listen it's like the country is not what it was he's staying from his point of view we're saying from our point of view i happen to be with somebody yeah. who voted for trump in the last uh in, in the last election i brought him on purpose and it's very funny what we yeah. took away from the show um and the show is is totally relevant, especially coming from our past political and social climate that still is happening today. We're still having rights taken away from women. We're still having oh, yeah. rights taken away from the LGBTQ community in 2022. Mm -hmm. And yet we're seeing the country from these assassins' points of view. And I wanted to ask you, Getty, because it's very controversial. If you take some of the lyrics literally, um, it's very vicious and it's a vicious attack on the political but, system, but it's also a proponent of some of these outlandish ideas that were like, oh my God, they're yes. a terrorist to your point, the January 6th. Are we supposed to sympathize with these assassins? What is the mission of the musical? That's a good question. And my, my feeling is that, um, you know, honestly, what I came out of this, this musical is, is that um, uh, people who are not heard on both sides, yes, mm. and I think that there's a there's a danger in in condemning. Uh, I, I I when you listen to uh, how Booth speaks in in this, you realize that he's some of his some of what he's saying is making sense. Hundred percent. Some of these people who who don't have the opportunities that 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 the rich or the wealthy have are left out. And their motivation is is to use the gun, which in symbolically is our country. Our country is nothing but guns, right? We 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 the way to solve any problem it feels like right now is with a gun, and 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 we exemplify that. Mm. So it's a question to me. It, it it's a it's a huge question. You know, I'm so anti-gun that. <laughs> that even I, I actually am so glad they never asked me to really fire the gun. You know, some of the actors w will fire the right. gun, but I, I get freaked out by, I'm sitting there like a, you know, like, like, <laughs> like that. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> because I, 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 but there are all kinds of questions that, that, that this brings up. But one of my main thoughts is, is that we have to listen to both sides. We have to figure out how to, to uh, come together or we're at a huge loss. I mean, democracy is very, as they say, very messy. Mm. And um, I think that, I think the show exemplifies that, that, that theme in itself, if I, that makes any sense. hundred percent. It's very funny that your song is what a wonder is a gun. Yeah. And what I yeah. wanted to ask you, you have this 
uh, unique talent. It really is your brand, and it's in everything that I've seen you do. No matter if it's like a slapstick type performance or full out comedy, there's still this duality that you have of it's it's this comedic timing and this energy that's very Getty. But then there's this <laughs> there's this like undertone. Um, it's uh, that has like gravitas, and it has like this dark tone. That it's well, just this dark comedy, and so your song was so commanding, and I I hate to like fangirl over it because I hate to be that it. person, but the <laughs> moment that you because you know we, we've had the show go on, and then you command the stage, and then there's total silence during your during your song, and you look at the audience, and it it chills you to the core, but it really is this kind of duality that you have as an actor, but also in the character, and also for the show, it's just this constant. What are we laughing at? Because you get so yes. uncomfortable, you laugh. What are, what are you laughing at? Right. We are laughing, but what are we really laughing yeah. at is, is, is a great way to look at assassins. Do you know, as an audience member, I think you've nailed it to, to, to that point to hear, hear the, the language the, and, and to say, why am I laughing at this? And I think that's kind of the genius of, of any really good, good piece is 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 to be able to accomplish that and you know i think pato is just he is he is to me the essence of the christian right mm. he just so believes in america so believes in so. in in the concept of just uh of of the american dream but he goes overboard right and and it's tragic you know, when you really look at that, because it's misguided, you know, in, 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 in its essence, but it's, 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 it's tragic. That's all I, I can really say. So, so I think maybe the gravitas, hopefully, and thank you for that, comes from that point of view, if now, that makes sense. Yes. Now, as an actor, and Stephanie, I want your opinion on this. Okay. Your creative approach, like Getty, you're, like everybody's always waiting for that Getty kind of wink to the audience, that kind of comedic okay. energy. And so we have seen it with even your, your role in ER, um, even like on Sesame Street. It's like, there's Getty. <laughs> and so I want to know, as an actor, your creative process, do you look for that comedic thread? Because that's what you know. And always. that's what you... So I was just thinking that today with this, uh, this audition I have, is like I have to take a drama for me. They don't necessarily want this, but I want to find something funny in it yeah. or uh, ironic or a twist in it because otherwise I find it boring as hell. And unfortunately yeah. a lot of drama doesn't do that enough, but the good ones all do, you know? And, yeah. th and that's what Getty does extremely well. No, is... oh, oh, well, thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's that Christopher Durang, you know, quote. Yes. Exactly. Like, I, I, I laugh at severest woe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, they, yeah, we we look for those juxtapositions. Mm -hmm. I think a actors do, and I think that 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 just um, you know, hopefully we can attain it. Sometimes I do not get it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but don't I you fight don't you like hell to try to find some place to go? But don't you, know. you feel like audiences crave that yes. though? They don't want it. I do. Yes. They don't want it to be one note. They want it to be a, a villain to be kind and funny and weird and a hundred percent. Yeah, and a, a good person to be a mess and a, yes. a snark. Sometimes it's just much more interesting. That's it is much more interesting. Yeah. Yes. Plus, yes. there has to be that yeah. redeeming quality that we have to root for a character somehow. You know, we have so many heavy shows coming out, like on HBO. Oh yeah. Um, and you know, not to slight these shows, but it's like you can see the wheels turning, like award season, award season. <laughs> You know, over oh, act, tragic about... actor, like da da da, and it's like, well, that's the only yeah. motivation. It's like, but I have to like these characters. I have yeah. to, I have to feel invested. And I have to feel invited in. Don't act at me. Act with me. Like, let me see your character. And that's what I loved about Assassins. You know, it's presented very old school, where the stage is there, and you know, the proscenium kind of frame. Um, uh, the staging, by the way, is is top notch. You know, I forgot it, this wasn't a Broadway show. You know, you just told it because it was so well done. Um, but even being far apart, you were still invited in. I felt like I was hanging out with these characters. I felt that I was in their situation. I felt their anxiety. Um, uh, Getty, I interviewed your co-star, Adam, um, who, who, who plays Oswald. And yes. what he was talking about in his research is he 
didn't realize what a broken man Oswald. He was, I think, 25. He had already had two kids. He was in a horrible marriage. He felt he was broke off his ass. He was broken at the age of 25. Can you imagine feeling that you were broken beyond repair at that age? Well, look on the streets of L.A. right well, now. Yeah, That's hello. What we, we yeah. got it everywhere, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's so much. Exactly. Uh, uh, there's just so much going on in this show, and I think that um, that the whole cast. And I don't know if it's because uh, opening night last year it was closed because of COVID, so everybody's come back with all of this new kind of energy. It was like, what the hell is going on with our country? <laughs> uh, but the cast really uh, has bonded, um, at I, least from an audience point of view, as I this think moving there was part. A, a huge change in the political system. I mean, what made me angry really made me angry. <laughs> You yeah. know, so so uh, it translated for all of us in some way once we understood that. I mean, let, I mean, I, uh, during rehearsal, I realized that uh, that none of the cast members went through the killing of JFK. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I I remember it as a kid so well. I was in third grade. I remember that shows you how old I am. <laughs> but uh, we had to take a teacher away because yeah. she uh, went crazy in front of us. <gasps> That's how yeah. how potent. And when they say that everything was quiet, nothing was heard, everything stopped as that that the the one song towards yeah. the end, it was true. Everything had stopped for almost. I I, I can't remember when it did, but it, it, so I have really visceral memories of all of this. As, well, I I can't go back to Booth, but. <laughs> I mean, yeah. but <laughs> But to JFK or to Roosevelt, or <laughs> but you know I I understand that. So so they there had to be something that they could have grasp onto, and I think what happened is that the the last president pretty much put us in in a situation where we um, grasp onto that. The story that you just told is a story that my mom would tell me year after year was about really? her memory of JFK. She was in school. She was in, in grammar school, and the teacher came in, and she was so broken up she couldn't even speak, and she just wrote on the chalkboard, the president has been killed. Oh my God. And yeah. then my grandfather, who never spent time home in front of the television because he was always out working, uh, she puts it, it was three days, stores closed, Every everybody was glued to their TV, nothing happened for three full days. Wow. D didn't matter what side, or what party you were for, the whole nation was mourning whole, together, yeah. and families were just glued to the TV, crying. Uh, that was a huge part. It was like, when was the last time we felt about a president like that? Uh, well, no. You know, I mean, the the closest thing that actually felt that made the world stop was nine eleven to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that's right. Probably, I, I had that same kind of visceral, if if it was emotional sense about it, is is was was that, and uh, uh, and you know, the the thing that probably saved me is with with JFK was is that I was a kid, I was I was watching the adults, but now. When 9-11 happened, I was the adult, and it was like yeah. I couldn't get out of it. So it was, it was interesting, you know, just to, if I have to equivalent it to anything at this point right now, well, um, it, I don't know. Could a hundred percent. And you would think that an attack on our nation, like we were attacked on 9-11, like the attack of our nation on the 6th, that we would have all come together, and it has not. But my mom even said my grandfather never cried, ever. The only time he cried was uh, was watching the funeral and the whole ass assassination. Um, I, I want to talk about East West Players. I okay. did not realize how many years it was around. I've seen shows at East West Players for the last 10 years, love seeing shows there because they – uh, they change the norms of what we think, even in terms of staging. And so if you've seen a show a million times, you see it at East West Players, you're like, wow, I have not seen that show. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Yeah, oh, great. Uh, totally. Yeah. It's like, it's so refreshing. You know how we watch the same movie over and over? We see Hamlet over and over, and it's like, you know, the basics are always there. Um, it's always a surprise, and it's always a refresh. Um, I didn't realize that it was around since 1965, by the way. Yes. Many, many, many it's years. Amazing. I, I wasn't there since 19, but yes, yes it was around 19. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you now, there's such an emphasis on multicultural casting. Uh, we've also had successful projects like Crazy Rich Asians, Parasite, Squid Games, uh, Shang-Chi. 
Uh, do you think visibility for an Asian actor is finally taking its place in Hollywood outside from stereotypical roles? Yes, I think, you know, in my day, especially during 16 Candles, of course, yeah. you know, we, we, well, we know <laughs> I got lambasted for that since the day I was born on it, basically. But <laughs> but uh, but that's all changed. You know, it's 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 getting it's getting so much better. I, 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 I the Asian faces are, are 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 exciting to see. I think also maybe I mean, the the quagmire that I have is is that um, I just hope that it continues i hope that um we can fund our stories you know that it's difficult it's not it's still not um you know our stories are there um honestly when you think about it it's it's also you know um it's also um foreign kind of base which call it you know uh stories from other countries that come in from asia but the Asian American kind of gets left out too, so it's a, interesting. It's, a, it's an interesting yeah. structure to me about how this business works and how how we actually um, present ourselves. So there's a lot more to go, if that makes sense. And um, I think it's there. I think that I think John Cho, Sander, all all those, you just uh, you know, uh, all of them, <laughs> Daniel Day, Tim, St uh, Steve. No, Park, all of them are really, really incredible now. So I'm really excited, you know, to, to, to see that. So it's definitely changed since the 80s. I have to tell you that right now. Now, does so we didn't have the community. You know, yeah. I always I always said what we needed. We needed uh, we needed the, uh, the African-American community behind us. We needed to act mm -hmm. like they did, you know, in demanding certain things. But uh, uh it was it we just didn't have a voice we're starting to get the voice it's starting to happen um it's part of our responsibility as an asian community to to to, to grab that i don't think we've really tackled it enough if that makes sense you know, I know we have a feeling towards, or I, I have a feeling, sorry, I'm putting my feelings, uh, about award shows, but I think the award shows, when Crazy Rich Asians came out and there was such a tension, we know a Shang-Chi was not just a box office hit, it was a critical hit, and then we were seeing younger generations seeing these superhero type personalities as Asian, and for them, they weren't seeing an Asian-centric film, they were just seeing a superhero film. Right. Um, and yeah. so I, I wonder, you know, Parasite did so well at the awards. Uh, we know yeah. Squid Games uh, swept up at the SAG Awards, which I was very excited um, yeah. because it took over some of these um, hot buzz kind of actors that we always see uh, be nominated. And so it was this total shift. And so, yes, awards are kind of outdated, but when they get it right, do they get it right? Oh, you're asking oh. me. <laughs> I'm asking both of you because I know you're, oh, I you're SAG know. members. <laughs> I'd be curious, Stephanie. I don't, I, well, gosh. I, you know, I have very distinct it? ideas about awards. In this time in our world, I feel like there's just too much of it. I feel like <laughs> we, I mean, okay, let's talk about SAG awards, for instance. Yeah. I don't know how much those award ceremonies cost but there are thousands of SAG members who've had insurance or worked for 40 years as supporting players who lost their insurance during the pandemic. Could Almost, this yeah. could, could this money have that they used to give the little green melted Peter Pan statue <laughs> uh, to people, could, could this money have helped their members? Because, and also awards period, it's so objective. You know, it's, it's yeah. like, it's, everybody has an opinion and nobody's is right and a lot of times if there are a lot of things to watch for the sag awards do you think the people who vote are watching every single thing i don't think so and if they do they're very very busy people watching television <laughs> well, so so basically they will vote for people they know well, th that's, that's or the, or they're going to vote for the media headlines that they've seen. Right. Or as, what as, the, the, the buzz is about this. And I feel like it, I can only look like sour grapes lady because I'm not nominated for anything. But I feel like <laughs> there's a lot of awards and it's a lot of the same people and they get to dress up and go to parties and wear diamonds. And maybe I don't care about that anymore. I'd rather see somebody in the Ukraine get get to go home, you know. Hundred percent, and I'll tell you, as as an entertainment podcaster, I get stacks of screeners 
every week, even when it's not really? award season, every week. You're fancy. No, no, but it's not even about <laughs> fancy because they know that I'm going to talk about it. But what I pull out to watch, unfortunately, is what I'm told this could be nominated, whatever, because I have to be informed ab- about it. Sure. But when yeah. people can't afford to fill up their tank of gas, they don't want to watch rich people award other rich people right. for getting paid millions of dollars. And that's the other thing. Bills. The more celebritized people get, the more their paycheck is then everybody under a certain point is getting paid scale plus 10. And that's not, it's not right. They don't need that much money. I mean, I feel like sometimes if the people at the very tippy top actually knew what everybody else is trying to survive on at, at this point, because I've been doing this for 28 years, I've watched it change a lot where, you know, the guest star has been replaced by the one day guest star and now the guest stars are co-stars, and that means they can just pay you less and less to do them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I just feel like, much like any business in this post-capitalistic world, the haves are getting heavier and the have-nots are naughtier. You know? Yeah. No, you've you've hit it right on them. I I couldn't agree with you more. Oh, good. I'm yeah. glad. <laughs> I, I, I I couldn't agree with you more. How I, I, I you're stating it. It's great. I, I'm struggling. You know, I uh, this year I I, I really uh, decided to go back and try to make a make because you know I had taken retirement because mm-hmm. I thought oh you know I'll just relax a little bit but that's not going to happen but maybe that's a good thing in some senses because now you know I'm trying to <laughs> try to find work you I, know yeah because you like need I, it or you lose like, your health insurance too. or I lose my health insurance yeah. absolutely so, so l- l- let's talk about this Getty we have a lot of actors. Um, watch the show, and they're they're knocking on doors, and they're doing what they need to do. When we look at a career of a Getty Watanabe, we see all the success. That's what leaps up from the page. What we don't see is the years in between projects, or for any actor with such a long career, there has to be lows and highs. How it, have you, as an actor, worked through some of those lows to be like, okay, keep at it, keep at it, um, especially when you did have the anchor of his 16 candles which i loved your your performance by that <laughs> uh, by the way we're, we're going to talk about that in in a minute but you had this anchor of like okay well that's that's what i did for that one movie look <laughs> i got all this other stuff how have you worked through some of those highs and lows um you know i always went back to the theater mm. believe it or not theater is our that, safe space yeah i think i think what happened to me was is that um, I I I realized I took a reality check, you know, about uh, about the way the business is set up. Either I try to become a producer, which I'm terrible at, you know, or I try to tell people what to do, which I'm terrible at. Interesting. And so uh, so I I am more interested in seeing what people do. <laughs> you know, I, I really should have been like. You know, like uh, which Magoog. I should have been a, a person that went to Italy and eat food and listen and interviewed people. That really should have been. I want to do I, that too. Yeah. Stanley Tucci <laughs> did it. I want now. Stanley Tucci did it. I watched two episodes and fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but there's some really good zucchini pasta recipes. Yeah, Stanley Tucci. Yes, thank yeah. you. I, yeah. Why that? Why all of a sudden his name disappeared? I don't yeah. know. But anyway, so I, I, I. I I think what saved me was uh, well, honestly, what saved me was was a lot was East West players because I would return to them. Yeah. I did a Lacage. lot of production there. I did some, you know, I love me doing musicals. There, I love being stupid and zany and and everything. So I got, I've always got in touch with the fun of it. Yeah, that's where the heart is. I feel like yeah. I did uh, yeah. play this. When was it? When did I do that play? Um, I did a play during COVID, so everything gets mushed together, and it just helped me so much to feel oh, like that's cool. let, I was on the right path because I missed it so much. And uh, there's not a lot of meat on the stuff I get to even audition for, you know. And this was yep. a two-hander with 90 minutes of nonstop talking and knife <laughs> fights and guns and yelling and monologues and trailer trashing. <laughs> um, so I had a good old time. But anyway, I'm saying I yeah. totally understand. That's where you go get your batteries recharged. It, it, it's a yeah. safe space for so many different people. And I know a lot of people have come out from doing a theater production mm-hmm. because they feel so safe. And, you know, but we also know theater is not well funded. 
it is not well funded, but you do make your family there, you know? I, yeah, and I th you're up sorry, Steph, because it becomes a community. You, st yeah. you actually get to know the actors. <laughs> Whether you like them or not, you still get to know the actors. <laughs> exactly. You, you know, know and, I, and you so probably much. have friends from plays you did yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do too. Uh, yeah. my, I did Les Liaisons, Dangereuse, in Pittsburgh, and one of my best girlfriends yeah. who lives in New Jersey is still my best girlfriend, you know? That's. So. <laughs> that's it and yeah no i i i i think the, the what was your favorite theater production you've mm -hmm. been in or give me top three i did a production at east west that i just recently we did about well i shouldn't say recent five years ago i did lacage yes oh yeah we have some of the I, pictures I by, by the way what's that we, we have some of the pictures by the way oh my god i what a I, joy I, that I, must have been from you know playing something like Gateau to 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 uh to zaza was just <laughs> just fun as hell and also i you know you always you always start with god can i do this you know can i can i can i bring something to this so there's always that scary trend <laughs> you know that scary start so uh, you know and self-deprecation and everything that you kind of go through to to try to figure it all out but um, but you get through it and you find something and 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 um, I was very proud of that Stephanie. I was very proud of that's wonderful um, that production it was I really... bet it, I bet you laughed and laughed though during rehearsal oh my god <laughs> oh my god I you know and uh, just yeah and it was it was fun to dress up it was fun to be you know just Zaza is just such a such a freeing character that's the know? other thing Alexander is that the farther away, like theater actors get away from who they are in oh, terms, 100%. it's so much more fun to do. Like, <laughs> I'm I, in this play. I was playing this trailer trash, crazy person, and people are like, <laughs> "You're very well spoken and dignified. You shouldn't be doing that." And I'm like, "I love to do that." That's Excuse I me, will for. I open up pork and beans? <laughs> <laughs> no. um, but Getty, but even taking a role like Lacage, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's kind of dangerous because it's so out there, and then we see Getty in a whole different kind of environment. It's a very, it's a, it's a play that brings up a lot of themes, especially now, you know, with like LGBTQ community. Were you trepidatious about being part of that or being seen? No, 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 not at all. It wasn't I, even I, a question. I think, no, I, I don't think I had any second thoughts. I, I, I was more concerned. Uh, you know, I'm always concerned with pulling it off. Because uh, I, somebody had asked me the question, is that do you ever get roles, you know, offered to you? And uh, usually I, I have, but uh, I, I know this sounds really weird, but I'm the type of person that would rather kind of read for it just so Interesting. I wow. <laughs> could figure out if I, if I could d d bring it to, I have such self-doubt, honestly. so odd. And, and so you just... You have to, you have to, you have to start somewhere, and and I don't think it's I don't think it's a, a tragedy or awful or anything. Like some some actors say, oh, self doubt, you can't have that. I I disagree with that. I, I, I think don't that, I don't think it's human not to have it. Yes, exactly. You know? Yeah, and maybe it challenges maybe, you, but you, yes. for you to be yeah. so open and honest about that, I think is so important for other actors to hear. Absolutely. Yeah, I I just think that 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 I gave that up years ago. <laughs> yeah, I, used, I used to cover that up, but now it's kind of like, it's really out there. So wouldn't you, know, you say and, that if, if you meet someone who's an actor, who's an egomaniac and has no self doubt, they're probably not someone you want to watch on screen or on stage. <laughs> wouldn't you? I you mean, want me to name names? Cause I can, I'm not a member go, of SAG. Go for it. <laughs> no, no, no. I won't do it, but you can. <laughs> So let's talk about acting and, and some of the roles we have to take. Uh, we have to address the 16 Candles. Um, at the time, it was such a funny character. I thought it was so great. Um, and looking at 80s films, you know, we know there were so many problems with 80s films, but it was that genre. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, obviously, representation by minority groups has changed a lot since then. Um, do you remember the first time you read the script? Did you ever think it was problematic? No, I, 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 you know, this, this had a lot of learning to do. I had a lot of learning to do because, um, you know, honestly, I was, uh, I was born and raised in Utah. Yeah. 
Wow. So I, I didn't have, um, we had, you know, Asian Japanese people, and, you know, uh, there, my, my mom came from the camps during in Idaho. So yeah. that's why we ended up in, in the uh, internment camps uh, the, and that she, uh, well, that's how we ended up in Utah. So I grew up mostly around, you know, the white Mormon crowd, basically. Those so, are the happening people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think what happened was that how I approached 16 Candles was that I, I, I kind of maybe rationalized it to the fact saying that here's a kid just looking for the American dream. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, and uh, you know, at that time, when you think about it, I was really the only Asian out there. Yep. Yeah. And so I could see why the Asian community felt the way that they did, you know, down the road, I went, Oh, I get it. Because, mm -hmm. because, y y you know, whether you know it or not, what you do on film really does affect people, I think. I think there's no way, there's no way to rationalize that. Um, so I, I agree with you completely. Yeah, so I had to, I had to learn from that experience about, about racism and about stereotypes and, 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 uh, and, and how that affected people. And, and it was, oh, there you are. <laughs> there you are. How old, were, how old were you when you did this? I, actually, I, I had just turned 20. I was hit 29. I was, I was, I was, everybody was 16 and 17. Uh, and I was, I was 29 years old. So uh, they Girl, all liked me because that skin. I, could, I, could, mm. I could, I could buy them beer. <laughs> It's a skill. <laughs> so I have to tell you, you know, looking at that film, where it came from, I thought the performance was hilarious. Yeah. And, you oh, know, I, yes. I, I think it's a shame if we're so quick to attack a stereotype that was created way before we've been able to have these informed conversations. I still want to laugh at your performance in appreciation. And, and like, as a stupid side note, like my mom and I used to be like, what's happening, hot stuff, when you would walk in the room? <laughs> it was part of... It was part of the language, and your character blew up. I mean, it was a huge success for that time. And so, yes, I can see looking back, it was harmful, but I there's still a, a joy of, to it. I had a group of, you know, a Asian comedian actors at that time. It was a, a group from East West Player called Kotofu that were that were really defending me. You know, just saying, "Look, this yeah. is just comedy. We, you know, you have to look at it through this, through this, through these eyes too." So, I think, I think the Asian community also had to kind of kind of figure out what they felt too you know at at that point and and they also had to realize that they had to step up more into the business because of it great so um so uh, there was some things that came out of it i mean out of the you know out of the protest you, when you think about it there were very very few asian executives mm -hmm seeing you know in in the industry so i i think i think perhaps maybe that helped raise some of the um you know some of the fervor to to action if that makes any sense along that note like we look back at gone with the wind and we see how problematic yeah. that is oh, yeah. yeah but we see the actress playing the maid uh has become part of even current pop culture talk um, and establishing, yeah. like, this is an actress, you know? Yeah. So I'm not so sure we just, like, cancel everything. You can't. I mean, everything is... There and it's are, a great it, performance. It's it, hilarious. Everything is different levels of gray. It's yeah. not black and white, you know? Yeah. It just isn't. Yeah. So, I mean, the step that Getty took in 16 Candles may have upset people, but he was there. Yeah. That's a step forward. You know, you got to start somewhere. You do have to start somewhere. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Uh, Getty, if you could just uh, talk about, you know, we are here in the U.S. bubble, that everything's fine here. Um, if you could talk about your mom's uh, internment, because that's um, oh. that's on our soil. It's, it's very visceral. And we're talking about what's wrong with country and democracy. This is such an important part of history that I think doesn't get well, talked about enough. I don't know. Do people? I, I keep thinking that people know about this, but maybe perhaps they, they don't. Well, part of it is that, that the, the, the Japanese were kind of just that my mother's generation didn't talk about because they were basically ashamed of it. That's exactly you know? right. So I guess it wasn't really put out there. In fact, when I heard my mom talk about camp, I thought she meant 
just regular summer camp somewhere. So I had no idea until actually until high school that I read a little blurb of it in the, and then I talked to my mom and, and she's, you know, slowly began revealing what, what uh, the Japanese were interned during American uh, citizens were interned during uh, World War II Japanese citizens because they thought that they were still enemies or loyal to, yeah. to, to Japan at, the, um, at that time. So they were all kind of taken at my mom's house, everything, the, all the, everything was taken away and, and they were put into these camps uh, all over across the country. There was one in Rowan, all, they were all over. I, but I visited a few of them. One was in Minidoka, which is in Idaho. There's Manzanar here and Santa Anita Racetrack was a gathering place um, where they, uh, they brought in all, all the Japanese there and then shipped them off and uh, some of them were in term for four years. And, oh my God. And, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a great history because the, uh, because the, uh, uh, my, my uncle was part of the 442nd, which was they went to Italy. Um, they joined the army, the American army, and liberate, helped liberate uh, Italy and went into Germany and, and um, uh, did that whole thing. So there was, it was just, a mess uh, when it came to that, but it was a, a severe injustice, I think, oh. to the to that that came about because of that. How does your did your mother speak of it years later? Was it something that gave her? No, a... you know, um, so, so there were certain generations that, that that did speak up and did did. My mom just wasn't one of those type of people that, that, or my dad. They, my dad was not in the camps, but he was outside of the camps working for the for the uh for the army mm -hmm. at some point uh, oh yeah oh my goodness wow. oh my goodness where did you get all that yeah that's is that i can't tell if that's manzanar that might be manzanar but there were there were you know how many like uh i think like 400 500 thousand people that were in yeah. Durham, oh my God. Durham, different areas so um I could be wrong, Don't, but there were a lot of people. I do know that, and uh, and just because of the way we looked, and 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 uh, uh, so we were all considered the enemy at that time. I, I watched so. a PBS special about people who lived uh, long lives, and most of them were being interviewed in, in their eighties, nineties. One lady was one hundred and three, and one lady was a Japanese woman who was in the camps. And most of these people who lived very long lives had lived through something like that. And they attributed their longevity to re that perspective giving experience in their life. They don't sweat the small stuff after something like that. Yep. And, and they find their joy and they go and they live and they live hard. And I thought that was really interesting. But there's also this part of the culture that keeps everything kept in, like the the – Latino culture. We don't talk about our mental uh, anguish. We don't talk about our depression. We don't talk about what we've been through. Yeah. Um, and so I'm I'm glad that you are able to tell your mother's story because the younger generation has no clue that this happened on our soil. No, there's there's so much uh, empty space in the history books for kids oh, right wow. now. Look at that. Oh yeah. wow. wow! Thank you, Tony. And, Tony, Tony Art is and, good. Yeah. And and that's only. A part of them because there were there was a camp in Texas. I mean, they were all over. So uh, and uh, uh, and see you of Jerome. Uh, where's it? there's a few others that are kind of missing there, believe it or not. And there's Minidoka. Yeah, there's Idaho. Okay, wow. Yeah. So it's a it's a stain on the history, basically. One of many. Trying to yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. it's kind of the energy behind Assassins where everybody comes from a different yes. point of view about our, our country. What's yeah. right? What's wrong? We don't know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Getty, your performance in Assassins, and I'm telling everybody go see Assassins at eastwestplayers.org until March 20th. Um, it's... It's not just a night of theater. They're like, oh, a Sondheim show. Yay, I love that song. <laughs> it's not that at all. It's There's silence when you walk out of the theater because everybody has to think about the lyrics that they thought that they knew. They have to think yeah. about what was presented. They have to think how it was presented. Um, 
and you're part of that, Getty, uh, your performance was electrifying. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And thank I love you. that you took a role that's like, it's an ensemble piece, but like we don't see Getty until kind of until we're into it. And it's like, there he is. It's 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 such a relief not to, you know, at my age, it's it's like I'm getting more of the, you know, just intermittent. I like that in some bizarre way. You know? <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, I can't keep up with them. <laughs> you know, I'm them backstage. Well, Why do you guys do it? It's like, well, and it's a Sondheim all... show, so the same, you know. Yeah. Also yeah. part of the cast are some very young players, I have to say. Yes, yes. Who might not I, know I, your breadth of work. What was it like working with some of these young actors? What would you love to tell young actors? Like what what advice <laughs> could be spoke? Like not to the but you know, like like girl, calm you down. You know, <laughs> I I don't really tell them. They kind of just absorb what's around and they absorb I mean, I I know a lot of them come up to you and absorb my process, which I I I'm kind of surprised by it. You know, I'm kind of like, oh, you were, you were, oh, there I am. There you you were watching, you're watching me. I thought, I said, oh my God. So I, there, the, you know, that's the, the bounty of an actor, I think, is to say, I kind of remember watching uh, of, of all the greats, you know, the movies that I did, you know, I would, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, I would just watch the actors that, that I, that I, that I worked with. So, I think that's kind of a natural process, hopefully. Um, so I, I'm bad at telling what to do because sometimes I feel like they, that they're, they're, unless they're so far off, usually the director handles it. And if they're so far off, then, then maybe I'll say something, but I very rarely do because I feel like I can make something out of it in some way. If that makes any sense. No, it's because you're such a kind person. And I'm just like, okay. Yeah. If you no, could... no, no, really. I if it's bad, I will I will <laughs> but okay. <laughs> I'll say I don't know if I can work with that. <laughs> Let me reframe this question. What do you think uh some of the mistakes early actors are making? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I just reframed oh, well, the whole no, question. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Uh uh I, I've had some really good teachers and um I don't, Stephanie. I don't know what, what, what your technique is, but but I came from the Meisner school, mm -hmm. so oh, um, it had to do. I, I, for me, it had to do w with listening, and and understanding what listening really is, whatever it is. But but, um, I mean, some actors, they they are listening, but they're not listening. Or, yes. you know. So I had to. I had to just. Uh, now I need to do a play with Getty. Do you know that on oh, IMDb, yeah, the quote under my name that I said on a podcast was listening is my favorite thing to do? Because oh, it is wow. my favorite thing. Because yeah. I can't get any juice if I'm not paying attention, you know? Yes. So, yes. And yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right. Listening is the first thing everyone should learn how to do. Yeah. And 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 Stephanie, I'm I'm such a violator of that sometimes, you know. In the we process. all are yeah. though, because yeah. we get in yeah. our little, we get <laughs> yeah. in our heads, and we're in entertainment. We're we have like healthy egos, like. But also, we yeah. we think too much, and we you know it's yeah. it's hard yeah. to be there. It's hard to just yeah. be there when you have a, you know, you have your appendix hurts or whatever's going on. <laughs> I know that came out of nowhere. I know but... what. <laughs> no, but I have to say, like at the beginning of the show, like Getty, I was talking over you and. Probably our listeners are like, why are you talking over Getty Watanabe? It's because I'm so excited <laughs> to participate in what you're talking about, you know. And there's just this like this energy. But I think you're right. The younger generation, they're all about selfies, and they're all about it's it's my performance, it's my performance. Uh, yeah. They forget, you know. And you worked with the best, Sondheim and Hal Prince. I just wrote a read a play. A friend of mine was a dresser on Broadway in the '80s. And that was quite that a time, but nobody had cell phones. So yeah. you were forced to interact at yeah. all yeah. times, which caused lots of drama and craziness. And I realized, like, I go to a set now, everybody's doing this. I don't get to know anybody unless that some, is fun. Uh, you know, on a little on the little things, Denzel Washington didn't want anyone to have a phone on the set. And I really love that because I ended yeah. up talking to people. Some of them I didn't like and some of them I did. But at least I got to know. But. Yeah. Um, I miss no, so that. I think that's another reason why kids, younger actors, don't understand being present. Hundred percent. 
Yes, I agree with you. And also, yeah, my my phone stays in the dressing room. I've never been on the set or anything. That's amazing. With my my phone, I, I it's just natural. It's it's, it's just it, because I, I feel like I I'm at that point that if I'm on my phone, I, I'm going to miss a cue terribly. <laughs> Well, you know, Patty Lapone used to read a magazine and smoke a cigarette in, in Les yeah. Mis. But, Getty, yeah. that, that's interesting you bring this up, and this brings us to our final question of the evening. That was Stephanie, by the way, who brought that up. That was very good. I like oh, that. yay for so. me. <laughs> this is why we love her to come. I, I think we should just make this like a regular thing. I, I would love to. Okay. In uh, Italy with pasta. <laughs> I'm sorry. We would be more fun I'm than... I'm there. <laughs> Getty will join us always. Yes. I'm there. <laughs> So this question came from one of your fans. Uh, why aren't you on social media? Uh, uh, oh, how do you know? Uh, we, we know. Oh, here's sorry. Why aren't you on social media? We know nothing about your personal life. Is that a conscious choice? No, no not at all. No, 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 not at all. And 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 uh, I've been I've been with the same man for 36 years. So uh, personally, no, I couldn't care less if anybody knew anything about me. Uh, the reason why I'm not on social media is. Well, one time at one point on Facebook, somebody uh, hacked into me and became me and did all these really weird things. So, and then I, I personally just have a problem with it, with with what it's doing to people. And the more I read about it, I just I just can't get myself to um, to participate, you know, in something that just feels like it's hurting people at this point. And I know that's probably foolish in some senses, but um, I, 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 um, and also there's another part of me that, that I, I, I don't, because I can't add very well. There's a little bit of ADD crap going on, you know, so yeah. I can't, I, I don't know how to maneuver through it. Like I'll, I tried to post something. This is back I, when five years ago and, and I hit something and it went and I went, I, I got so panicked Yeah. that I, you know, and I thought, this, I don't need this. So it was kind of like, it was kind of, but no, I mean, the best, best way, I mean, are, are they asking how to, if they want to know anything about how, the best way is doing these kind of shows, basically. Oh. <laughs> if they, if and, they have any questions, they should ask them on the show. And 100%. And social media has become such a part of being an actor, which I'm like, uh, what the hell does that have to do with your acting? You know, yeah. for certain <laughs> networks, uh, they actually have you put how many followers you have next yep. to your name, which is so yeah. disgusting to me. And yeah, you know, there's, there's, there. It just, it's, it's something I've just a- avoided, and I'm really happy <laughs> without it. So it's kind of like it doesn't. Uh, I, you know, I mean, what do you say? I mean, well, I just know, feel could... bad for up and coming actors that have to put their yeah. emphasis there rather than but, doing their craft. But and they're enjoying doing, it. doing their craft. I can't tell you how many selfies like during auditions and all that. Oh, I'm like, no, it's gross. How are you preparing for your audition if you're too busy doing a <laughs> selfie? But, like, hello. But they're not. They're they're not really actors. Then they're personalities. <laughs> they're not. Yeah. That's a different thing. To me, yeah. And I, look, I've I've actually I'm zipping my wait, mouth shut. I have coached. <laughs> I, I have am. coached people with thirty million followers who get pilot auditions and want to act, and I get asked to come in and coach them, and it's pretty sad because they don't really shouldn't be doing that. They don't know what to do. Just because they can do funny skits on TikTok does not mean that they are an actor, but. Someday maybe that will be discovered. I don't know. So the controversy <laughs> happened uh, last month. This actress Uh-oh. got a three movie deal from Netflix for Uh-oh. being a TikTok star. Who? Tell me. You can Google it. Okay. That makes. Oh yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, cr- yeah. No, I'm sure that. Yeah, and it's I'm like, sure that happens. I'm Look. gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> Getty, l- let me ask you: How have you changed the most as a person? From stepping on stage on Broadway for the first reviews to where you are now. Oh wow! Uh, how have I changed? Gosh, personally, um, I've gotten more comfortable in my skin. If that makes any sense, um, uh, I, I, I don't. I think in this time and age, in this day and age, you can't. You, you've got to just really love the moment uh that you have right now i think there's no other 
recourse than to do that at this point because of all the things that we're we're experiencing now. So um, uh, uh, if anything, uh, and as I got older, but if anything, life is extremely precious to me right now. Friends are really extremely precious. Yeah. And um, and watching watching my fellow actors discover that it just be happy is just it's, it's really a great place to be with in the East West players to see that too. So I I uh, I, I I think how I've changed is it, it it's less it's become less me in a, in a way I guess if that makes any sense. That makes that sense. That was beautiful. That oh. it was beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Talking to a veteran that's been there and done that. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Been there. I'm not sure if I've done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you will. <laughs> Getty, what a joy to chat with you. Thank you. And what a joy yeah, to be able to see you on you. stage. Thank, um, thank you. In Sondheim. Uh, you know, yes, that's your, you first. Your man. Hello, Steve. <laughs> and, and now I have a new thing on my goal list. Work with Getty. Yeah. Oh, Someday. Stephanie, I'd love that. Are you kidding? In a, oh in a play or in a show on oh, TV I, or whatever. I, I would love that. I think it would That's be, we would have great Thank fun. You. And we'd leave our phones in our trailers. <laughs> <laughs> and a report about the whole thing from the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, yeah, go see don't. Assassins until March 20th. Also, go to eastwestplayers.org and make a donation. Um, the theater's bringing you stellar oh. productions over and over. Thank you. Getty, what a joy. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciated this a lot. Thank Take you. Care. I'm, I'm going to come back and see it, by the way. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> Bye, Bye. Thank you so much. Bye now. Bye, Getty. What a joy. Truly. All right. Can you talk a little bit about the SAG Awards? Well, I did a little bit. I know. But I want to know, as a SAG member, so they send you... They send you things. And, you know, I've actually didn't vote this year because I will not vote if I do not watch everything. I won't. I won't. And I didn't have time to watch everything. But aren't you giving your vote to somebody else? No, everybody gets to vote. If if they're a paid up SAG member, you get to vote. Um, I I didn't agree with some of the things that happened. Frankly, I really, you, you'd probably hate it. But I love. I don't want to get you in trouble, by the way. Uh, oh, I won't get in trouble. I'm going to okay. say something I liked. I sure. loved Kristen Stewart's performance in that a uh, Stewart movie. Did you hate it? Because it, it's so polarizing. When we're talking about like acting, and you know well, what acting is what, about, here's what: Are we congratulating her for playing Diana, or are we no, congratulating her? She's not playing for Diana. Making... <laughs> Did you read at the beginning? This is not the story of Diana. This is a fairy tale. It's a fable. People are thinking it's a biopic where she's supposed to be playing her. It's but an we, idea of her in a. You're a such a good actress. I'm so confused. It it was look. Are it, you congratulating her for not being Twilight and she came to this? No, no. I'm congratulating her for doing some really personal work and a really good British dialect and and also, I didn't see her in there at all. You know, I see a lot of these people who get nominated again and again, and it's the same person most would you, of the time. Would you have seen Spencer if you weren't told to see it? Like, uh, hey, this is a great film. Uh, yes. Who were some? I of was the... not. I was not told to see it either, and I did not but get. It. I did not get a screener for it. I paid oh. to see it. See, Honey, we have total. I'll give you. Okay, but I have to tell to you, back. I got into I got into arguments with people who would go on my wall and say, "Ah, she's a piece of crap." I'm like, say that on your wall. I'm allowed to have my opinion, but that's essentially, to my mind, what is wrong no, with awards. No, but this is an important Wait, conversation. This is though. what's wrong with awards, though. We're not fighting. It's a, just... no, no, we're not. We love each other. Um, but people are just—it's just people's opinions. There are guys giving out theater awards in L.A., and it's just them giving an award about what he thinks is good. You know, to me, then we should have an award for everything. Like, who does the best, you know, mamba in their underwear, in their bathroom? I don't know. I'm just saying it's that me. it seems to me that giving awards and giving 
and having more and more and more award ceremonies because they are growing. There's more and more. But there, there should not? be some acknowledgement for great performances. Yes, but it should be something where there's a cross section of opinion rather than the same twelve people. Like a <laughs> like a debate. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. To me, the answer is take all that money from the SAG Awards and help your members have health insurance, especially your senior citizens that you but you could off say that health like, insurance. Let's take all that special effects money from Star Wars and just have it be like not like the yeah, money's going to be spent. No, the money's going to be spent, and and the money. But SAG is a union or a guild. It is not, uh, you know, Lucas Films or whatever. It is a an entity that's supposed to be helping the people who spent their lives being loyal to a union, not working off the card, not working behind, you know, behind the backs of the union. You have to do, you have to give your money, give your dues, do your thing. Um, if you're, you have all these people following the rules and putting their heart and soul on the line because they're so excited that, and I was, that you, you get vested after 20 years then when you retire, you get your health insurance. It's a miracle. It's the one, it's the, the, the what do they call it? The golden chalice. I'm looking for a word that I don't have right now because I'm tired. But it's like the thing you're working for that you can just breathe and sigh easy when you hit your 20 years of vesting, which is really hard to do. So the people who have gotten that far in the business, that's an achievement. And they've done it by playing people's lawyers and moms and nurses and, you know, you know, and, and you've done that when you look. At I've your, done all those yeah. things, you know, and I spent my life kind of always. I love it when I get a weirdo or something recurring that's more meaty because that's what I'm hoping. I'm still hoping to get a break. <laughs> but, um, you know, but the fact is I was counting on my years of vesting to help my future. And now it's not. But there are people wearing Harry Winston diamonds and getting a little melted green Peter Pan statue. And what's with the statue? Do you have an opinion about the SAG Awards statue? I have an opinion about the SAG Awards. Okay, tell me your opinion. You know, I figured it was like, oh, well, it's the SAG Awards, so people actually know. And I did love that Squid Game won a lot of the awards. But it's not a SAG mo a show. It didn't, it did not. They're a member of SAG. No, they did not. Sh they shot in another country. They did not shoot under SAG auspices. What happens is probably. Okay, and I don't, this is what I need to know. Yeah, well, and and this is something. Because I, I was glad that people like I do not Stewart have, or like all the normals weren't winning left and right and grabbing. I think whatever. what probably happened, and I do not have the right answer for this for sure, is that Girl. they shot it because they shot it for whatever they did, and and um. Then they have to be taft Hartleyed into the union in order to be part of SAG Awards. So they were not union members when they shot the show, is what I'm saying. And that seems not quite right. But I feel like... That's why I'm asking you, because I have no clue. But it's just anything goes. That's the thing. And anybody's opinion. And frankly, there's so many performances that you don't see because they are not in the top 20 that it breaks my heart that people don't see them because... We want fresh faces. We really want them. I think we do. Um, we did get a fresh face with West Side Story. Yeah, we got some. We get some, and a lot of them are from other countries, too. The fresh faces are British a lot, and that's also a, a thing that's union-wise. I can't go work in the U.K., but a U.K. person can work here, So, and they get paid more here. Uh, and... There's just a huge uh, exotic pull to grab somebody who's starting out in Australia or the UK or New Zealand rather than get your homegrown people from drama school here. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand why that is, but it's how it is right now. I mean, they don't find the Meryl Streeps anymore. They don't. They don't go to Juilliard and pick them out. Or Yale. It's funny, if Meryl Streep were to come out today, she probably wouldn't she get would cast. Not, she would not get nope. a job. No. no. What do you think about West Side Story? Be very honest. We can clip this out okay. if we need to. Yeah, I just want to say that I, the one thing I object to in the responses, what? What's no, that? I'm just looking at the time. Yeah. Okay. I thought Ansel Elgort was great, and I don't know why people are, are slamming him. What? And you thought not so? 
See, we totally disagree. If you want vanilla ice cream, I've always thought that Tony is always a throwaway. He has to sing some of the most memorable phrases from West Side Story, and then you're going to make him vanilla and everything. Like, do you ever believe he was in a gang? Do you ever believe that he was vested in this? Did you we believe, need anything, to believe anybody was in a gang? Really? Well, no, he didn't. So time to <laughs> Yeah, but even in the original, I was like, well, the original was so great. But. We never believe Tony is a gang member. No, we don't. But so it's, let's it's... make Tony rougher and... Sorry. It's okay. I have a lot of feelings about this. You do, obviously, and nothing is perfect. That's what... I mean, and, and I've been watching ever since pre-SAG Awards thing. is that people arguing about nothing Steven Spielberg versus the old West Side Story. People arguing about whether Kristen Stewart's a skag or whatever. I don't know that she doesn't deserve to be nominated. When was the last movie that you were able to relax and just watch? That was so good. Oh. You're just like, oh, I get to watch this film. It's difficult, That's isn't it? That's really hard. It is difficult. I can't even tell you. Do you mind if I share mine? Yes, please. Last film that I was able to just watch and be like, was Requiem for a Dream. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. I don't know if I even enjoy watching them. That's the thing. Because I have in to the watch business. them from a different. It's like, yeah. we can't just ever watch a show. We can't ever just. You like, know what I do to escape from that is I watch obscure foreign films a lot. Um, also because I can put on the brother. subtitles oh, yeah. and sit on my uh, bicycle and exercise while I watch them. Yeah, but you lost me at exercise. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to make you exercise sometime soon. Honey, I'm, I'm running my mouth this whole it. episode. How much more? Are you sweating? A little bit. <laughs> yeah, I sweat. <laughs> I sweat when I wake up. <laughs> Stephanie, tell everybody them to find you and follow oh, you. Oh, I'll see you on Twitter. I'm at Herbness, E-R-B-N-E-S-S. On Instagram, I'm Stephanie underscore Herb. Underscore official. I didn't pick that one. Someone picked it for me. And we're sending you such great energy for your audition tomorrow. Thank you. I would love for this one to go very well. I heard about it. Yes. Can't talk about it. No, you can't. Um, but I'm coming to set if it happens. Oh, oh yeah. Hundred percent. Yes, you will. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a life. fun show though. But it's yeah. like you know, it's we always have fun. Though. We always have fun. Yeah, we do. Uh, it's always a grab bag of fun here every week on On the Rocks. Big thank you to our fabulous guest, my fabulous co-star, <laughs> Stephanie Herb, and of course our engineer and owner of UBN, Tony Sweet, launching an LGBTQ podcast, by the way. Ooh. So if you're looking to have your voice be heard, contact us today. Also, our social media clip editor, Alexis Mendez. Please like, share, subscribe, so we can continue bringing this to you for free. It costs a lot for us to look this good. <laughs> Coming up, we have pop star Nick Osen, born and raised in Ukraine. He became an American Idol-esque in Russia, and he fled to U.S., and he's releasing new music here, so we're talking to him. We also have musical impresario Michael Feinstein. <gasps> wow. Yeah. And we also have NCIS LA's Barrett Fawa is coming, who also has a uh, Broadway. Oh, okay. I don't know. I don't know everyone. Ah, on that show. Well, I'll clip that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm t I don't know everything. <laughs> he only did 280 episodes of NCIS LA. I wasn't in one with him. You were like dying on the street or something. No, I wasn't. I was a therapist at a, a drug rehab center. Well, Barrett Fowl is on the way. So <laughs> glad to bring him to you. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, stay sexy, and more importantly, stay tipsy. Sasa. This has been another episode of On the Rocks. Tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On the Rocks On Air. Find everything On the Rocks for free at ontherocksradioshow.com. Subscribe, like, review, and share. Until next week, stay fabulous.